Hello again everyone, it's me Matt, thanks for joining me. Before we talk about this absolute behemoth today, let me know in the comments section what weapon system out there truly gives you the heebie-jeebies or creeps you out or is just terrifying. This is one for me. This is an absolute devastating piece of equipment and let's hope for the love of everything they never get used in full capability. We are talking today about Russia's most formidable strategic weapons and one of them being the RS-24 Yards, an intercontinental ballistic missile system. This behemoth, also known as the Topol MR, or NATO codename SS-29, is a nuclear-armed ICBM-mounted system on a massive, absolutely massive, 16-wheel transport erector launcher known as the TAL. I mean, we're basically looking at a truck the size of a locomotive, and it's crawling through some of the most remote forests and backroads you could ever imagine, carrying a missile capable of striking targets across the globe. And in today's video, we're going to break down everything we need to know about the Yards from its origins to the vehicle launcher. So let's get started on the background of how it evolved from its predecessor, the Topol M. Now, the RS-24 is a family of missile systems, ICBMs, that represent the latest evolution of the famed Topol family of road mobile missiles. This was first tested in May 2007, entering service around 2010. It was developed as a modernized variant of the RT-2PM2 Topol M, and in fact, it was essentially the same missile as the Topol M, but with a twist. The Yars carries a multiple nuclear warhead system instead of just one. This change was a direct response to shifting strategic needs by the mid-2000s, and Russia sought to increase the firepower of its mobile ICBMs to counter emerging missile defenses. The Topol M was the first post-Soviet ICBM deployed in the late 1990s, equipped with a single 550 kiloton warhead. The vehicle is sometimes called the Topol MR, meaning Modernized Topol M. This took a proven design with the outfitted system of the MIRV, or Multiple Independently Targetable Reentry Vehicles. In practical terms, this means that each Yars missile can actually deliver three or four nuclear warheads to different targets instead of just the one, dramatically boosting its destructive potential and truly devastating. And this is why I really don't like normally talking about these kind of systems because it's something that is being used. I mean, it's the end of days. Let's just be honest. If this is going to be utilized in combat, uh, we're pretty much all done for. Now, some reports even suggest it could carry up to six to ten different warheads or decoys if needed, though the typical load is believed to be three warheads of 150 to 200 kilotons per system. Despite the new name and capabilities, the Yard shares a lot of DNA with the Topol M. It uses the same solid fueled three-stage propulsion and measures roughly 22 to 23 meters in length. It's heavier than the Topol M, about 49 to 50 tons in launch weight, and due to the expanded payload, this is making it an absolute beast to travel around off-road, but it does very well at that. The word IAZ itself is an acronym for the Russian phrase, and here we go, Yadnyera Rakheta Sretsvnyana. Hopefully I'm saying that right, I'm sure I'm not, but it means nuclear deterrence rocket. And true to its name, the RS-24 has quickly become a cornerstone of Russia's nuclear deterrent since its deployment, gradually replacing the older Topol and Topol M missiles. But now we know what the Yars missile is and why it was developed, let's take a closer look at the incredible vehicle that carries and launches this weapon. One of the most impressive aspects of this system is the Transport Erector Launcher, or the TEL, essentially a giant specialized truck that carries the missile, raises it to its firing position, and launches it. The Yars TEL is built on the MZKT792216 x 16 super heavy duty chassis, 16 wheels, all wheel drive, originally developed in Belarus. This hulking vehicle is about 20 meters long and weighs over 100 tons, including, of course, that missile, which weighs about 40 tons. Roughly the weight of a loaded Boeing 757, and that's on wheels. Despite its bulk, though, the design allows surprising mobility, and the TL can travel up to around 45 kilometers an hour on roads and has a range of around 500 kilometers without refueling. This is absolutely critical. There's no point having a strategic deterrent if you can't keep it moving into different portions of where it needs to hide or areas where it needs to go. It's designed and engineered to handle tremendous amounts of weight and the missile itself across rugged terrains. The eight axles with 16 oversized tires and multiple different variants of the tires are steerable on the first, second, third, sixth and eighth axles, giving it reasonable turning radius. The suspension is an independent hydropneumatic system which keeps the ride stable and smooth even off-road. 
This is absolutely critical for protecting the missile's very delicate guidance systems from bumps and vibrations during patrols. The tyres are extra wide and feature a centralised tyre inflation system that the driver controls on the fly. By adjusting the tyre pressure, the TAL can gain bad attraction on snow or soft ground, preventing it from getting bogged down, which is something you really don't want to have as a strategic deterrent considering the cost of these units. In fact, these launch vehicles are designed to operate in extreme weathers, from minus 50 degrees Celsius in Arctic cold to plus 45 degrees Celsius in desert heat, and can ford water even up to 1.1 meters in depth, meaning they can keep moving virtually in any Russian weather or environment. The TL's layout is very distinctive. It actually has two separate driver's cabs at the front, flanking a central engine compartment. The left cab seats two, a driver A commander, and the right cab seats one. Both cabs feature a bullet-resistant glass and MBC system, protecting them from all sorts of nastiness. And under the hood of this absolute monster is a mighty V12 diesel engine, the YMZ847, producing 800 horsepower, providing the muscle needed to haul the missile across country. This engine, along with the 8x8 drive and all axle sets powered with all-wheel steering, is what really gives the ability for this vehicle to negotiate narrow forest roads and muddy tracks despite its size. The rear of the vehicle carries the launch canister containing the missile. When moving, the canister lies horizontal with the length of the chassis locked in place. It also carries stabilization jacks and outriggers that can be lowered to the ground when preparing to launch to brace the vehicle. Everything about this vehicle is built for self-sufficiency and robustness. It has onboard generators, navigation systems, and communication gear, so it can operate far from different bases or other units. Simply put, the Yars TL is a mobile launch pad, marveling at the engineering that gives it a 49-ton missile, a very smooth ride enough to be able to maintain readiness when going absolutely anywhere. It is in some regard a mobile base. It can basically host the troops within it and its crew, for a long period of time, but of course it's not left on its own, it is always escorted by a convoy of vehicles to keep it sustained and to protect it from ambushes, which is a juicy little target for special forces if they were looking for these in the back country. Operating the Yars missile though in the field is a very, very complex process, it's not as simple as just raising the tube and launching the missile. It's designed to be efficient though so that the crew can shoot and scoot. It is also designed to be kept in its transport launch canister at all times during transit for as long as possible. There is no testing of this system. You don't deploy the rocket pod and put it out into its outstretched position unless you are going to launch. This is because the missile has a number of different servos and systems inside of there that unless you're ready to fire, you do not want to activate the system. The canister acts like a protective silo on wheels, shielding the missile from the weather and keeping it completely stable. The missile is stored, quote, cold, which is unfueled since it's a solid fuel which is built into the rocket stages. It can remain in the canister for extended periods, but must be periodically checked. Crews perform regular maintenance systems checks on patrols to ensure the missile and the launch are ready for a moment's notice. One of the most important things about this system is it's not something that you can just ignore and say, well, everything's good to go. It is always checked. It's just like having a missile silo where they go over and over again on their drills, but with a vehicle of this kind, it's to the 10th degree. I can't even imagine the number of checks you have to do when you have a nuclear missile on the back of your truck. There's a lot going on. And of course, the supporting vehicles that go along with it, whether or not the you know escorts or the you know systems that kind of coordinate with the missile launches are very, very important. Once vertical, the final launch targeting data is uploaded to the missile's guidance systems via a TEL communication link. This data may include updated trajectory info, target coordinates, and GLONASS satellite inputs for precision targeting. It uses the cold launch technique common to many Russian ICBMs. In a cold launch, the initial charge, usually a compressed gas generator or small powder charge, catapults the missile out of the canister before making its main rockets ignite. So after the launch command, you'd see a burst of gas propelling the missile upward. Within a fraction of a second, the first stage rocket motor ignites in mid-air, clear of the TEL. This method protects the launcher from the fiery rocket exhaust and propulsion. Very important if you ever wish to use the TL again, which of course you're going to want to do. It also reduces wear on the missile from the ignition shock. Once the first stage is lit, the Yars roars skyward and quickly accelerates past the sound barrier. The crew's job, of course, then is done. The missile's onboard inertial guidance and small post-boost vehicle will handle the rest, deploying warheads on the course of their targets. And for the love of everything, I really hope it never has to happen. The post-launch reloading, though, is also quite complicated. 
After the launch, it's obviously without a missile, and in real conflicts, these events are also strategic. You need to be able to get a new missile if being launched in anger, and reloading might be a moot point for the most part. However, in exercises or hypothetical reload situations, the launcher must withdraw to a safe area, back to its base, and reload. Reloading a 50-ton ICBM in the field is not a trivial task. It's typically requiring a specialized crane and support vehicles to bring a fresh missile canister. Now, in practice, the Yars units would return to the regimental base or a predetermined logistics site to be rearmed. The launch canisters are reloadable. Essentially, the MT2 can be removed and a new sealed canister can be placed with inside of it, hoisted onto the TL. This is done with very heavy equipment at base, not during the heat of battle. As one report notes, the launch tubes can actually be reloaded back at base, assuming there's a base to return to. The process, though, can take several hours and involves personnel lifting the canister with a gantry crane or securing it onto the tail manually. This is a very tedious task, and at the end of the day, if you've just launched a nuclear weapon, it's highly unlikely that you're going to have the chance to launch another one. Between launches, the missile stays safely stored with its canister, and at the home bases, the tails often park in hardened garages or shelters, with the missile remaining on the vehicle. The canister provides the climate control to some extent and the protection from outside environments, but again, they are checked within their hangars as well. Crews train to perform silent launches all the time from hidden positions, meaning they practice all procedures up to just short of ignition to minimize signals an enemy could detect. Life as a crew member on these vehicles sucks. It's a life on the road. The crews support the vehicle essentially completely out of the vehicle, and do long distance exercises or patrols and they will set up perimeter securities at rest stops and the soldiers establish a camp overnight. The TL crews can sleep inside the two cab truck or in tents though always with an armed watch. It's reported that Russian mobile ICBM units go a month long patrol. Basically they send them out and just do circles in the back country and then bring them home and put them to bed. I can't imagine being a crew member in that kind of environment doing month-long deployments practicing on those vehicles in such a serious environment. One notable aspect is the maintenance support. The Yars TL is a high-tech machine, so engineers accompany the convoy to perform routine servicing, and the fact that the entire missile unit can function away from base for long periods is a testament to how much thought has gone into the support train as they basically carry a small city worth of support to keep these nuclear launchers operational and on the go. The RS-24 Yars Tells are a direct product of Russian strategic thinking that prioritizes flexibility, maneuverability, and survivability of their nuclear deterrent. By constantly moving and hiding, they ensure that Russia's nuclear sword can stay in play even under dire circumstances. This mobility-based deterrent has often been honed since the days of the Cold War as the SS-25 Topol, and the Yars continues that legacy with even more capability. In a sense, each Yars TL is like a chess piece the opponent can never quite pin down, preserving the balance of nuclear threat that underpins the deterrence. The system is constantly being modernized, and one of the biggest aspects of modernization is adapting the Yars to be a different launch method. While initially deployed on road mobile launchers, the Yars has also been installed in silos. In late 2014, and again in 2019 to 2021, Russia test launched Yars from silo-based launchers, and by 2022, they began loading Yars missiles into older silos. This replaced the older UR-100N and the Topol M systems, and can take advantage of existing hardened silos that might even carry more decoys or fuel since the weight is less of that of a transport issue. The modernization plan aims to unify the missile types so that both mobile and silo forces use Yars, simplifying training and maintenance while boosting the warhead count under the current force limits. It's clear that this road mobile ICBM has cemented itself as a bit of a core component of Russia's strategic nuclear forces. But looking ahead, what does the future hold for Yars and its gigantic tail launches? In the near midterm, the Yars is set to remain the workhorse of Russia's land-based nuclear deterrent. The Russian Strategic Missile Force has been phasing out older single warhead systems like the Topol ICBMs and even the early Topol Ms, replacing them with the Yars across their missile divisions. As of the mid-20s, the Russian military has rearmed multiple regiments with the Yars, both in mobile units and in silos, and the commander of rocket forces indicated that by the end of the decade, virtually all legacy ICBMs, Topol, older SS-19s, etc. will be replaced by Yars and the new heavier RS-28 Sarmat. This means that Yars Tells will continue patrolling and performing deterrence missions well into the 2030s. And of course, there's going to be a lot of different variants and upgrades. The potential of the Yars M upgrade and the integration of the avant-garde hypersonic glide vehicle is also on the books. 
Systems and weapons like this fascinate me, purely out of fear. It's a huge feat of military engineering, from its 16 wheeled gigantic launcher to a split-second launch sequence that can unleash nuclear devastation. It combines high technology with harsh practicality. And I have to admit, considering the field functions that it has to complete, it's very, very impressive, but truly terrifying. Love it, hate it, or fear it, right now these vehicles are patrolling the back country of Russia. And the Yars is an integral part of that precarious balance that has really set up a global nuclear war deterrent and prevented somewhat for decades. And with that, I'm going to wrap up, because talking about this system does give me a little bit of a hairs on the back of my neck situation, because the world is a complicated place, we're in a very difficult situation globally I think right now, and this system is just something that when I study and learn more about, which by the way, I've been researching this quite a bit, and I could talk probably for another 20 minutes, but I'm not going to bore you with it. This deep dive really indicates the fear factor. Uh, and if you found this exploration informative and engaging, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. For more in-depth military tech content, of course, click the little bell by the subscribe button. And thanks for those who have been supporting me financially via Patreon and PayPal. Can't thank you enough. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think of this video. Until next time, stay curious, stay safe, and we'll see you in the next video. All the best, folks. Bye-bye.